Good afternoon and welcome. The presentation, to, presentation today is From Chronic Injustice to Health Equity, Learning from the HIV Movement and Disability Justice to Confront MECFS in the Time of Long COVID. We're honored to have JD Davids, a longtime activist and advocate as our speaker. This meeting is hosted by the US Action Working Group with meeting support provided by the Massachusetts MECFS NFM Association. So if you get emails from the Mass ME, don't worry about it. My name is Charmian Proskauer and I currently chair the US Action Working Group. Before we begin, I'd like to say a few words about the US Action Working Group. We are a group of over 100 individual advocates from 25 different states in the US, as well as representatives of MECFS organizations. And we've been active since 2015. We have a monthly meeting and an active listserv, which we use to share information and publicize opportunities to take action. But since we are an informal group, the US Action Working Group does not sponsor actions or take positions. Our members act as individuals, but actively support one another. We welcome new members. You can learn more and join at usawg.wordpress.com. Now, a few words about today's meeting. The meeting will be recorded, but although you may be able to see one another on your own screens, the recording will show only the speakers. Please stay muted to minimize background noise. At any time, you may submit questions using the chat, and we will try to answer as many as we can during the Q&A that will follow JD's presentation. Please note the disclaimers, especially that we cannot answer questions related to any medical condition. Now I'd like to introduce our moderator, Art Mirren, a longtime USAWG member who will introduce our speaker. Art is the parent of a person living with ME and is the leader of ME Action California. Art has done advocacy work with the California Legislature, the University of California Health System, and various state agencies, and has also done advocacy work at the federal level. He has published papers on the prevalence, economic impact, and particularly government funding levels for ME in relation to the burden of the disease with co-authors Mary Dimmick and Dr. Lenny Jason. Art will moderate and participate in the Q&A. Art? Okay, thank you, Charmian. As ME advocates, related issues that enter our consciousness and discussion are the plight of chronically ill people, health inequities, the connection with long COVID, and the success of the AIDS movement. Today's speaker, J.D. Davids, is just the right person to bring all these things together. J.D. is a board member of ME Action, a co-founder of the National Network for Long COVID Justice, and has an extensive history with the AIDS movement. I've only gotten to know and work with J.D. over the past year, and I've been totally impressed with his intelligence and insight. Having J.D. speak is a real treat. Today, JD will be discussing current strategies for shifting the narrative on ME, long COVID, and complex chronic conditions using lessons from HIV activism, disability justice, community mobilization, and alliance building from his decades of movement work. Okay, thank you. Um, hi, my name is JD Davids, and um, I'm here in Brooklyn, New York, uh, which is the um, unceded territories of the Lenape Canarsi people. And I wanna thank you for having me today. I have some slides, if you could go to the first slide. So uh, thank you. Um, I have a lot of slides, so I'm going to go through them fairly quickly and hopefully not too quickly. And I wanted to let you all know also these are two it would be terrible for your printer if you have a home printer. So we'll have a lighter background version that will be posted along with the recording of the session. Next slide. So here's a bit about me. Um, I've been chronically ill since childhood, maybe since birth, I'm not really sure. I have a history of, of trauma uh, and abuse as well as privilege as a, 
raised um, professional class white person. Um, and I have uh, a typical or mild uh, presentation of multiple complex chronic conditions, including neuromyelitis, optic spectrum disorder, myalgic encephalomyelitis, and um, others. Uh, like there's a comma instead of a period because maybe the list is growing and now includes long COVID. Um, I'm going to read you a little bit more about me now. Um, I'm a strategist with more, I'm a, sorry, I'm a transgender writer and strategist with more than 25 years of experience in HIV AIDS and queer health advocacy policy and journalism. My path has been shaped by world changing protests and intersectional organizing in HIV and LGBTQ movements, um, research advocacy, working alongside people living with HIV and black, uh, black, brown, indigenous people of color comrades, plus research advocacy, digital health media work, a bevy of clear queer pleasures, radical patient and peer education work and more. Now I'm committed to sharing information and unique approaches to living well with illness, driven by my passion for better real world information about health, sexuality and community and drawing on my training as an HIV treatment act activist, research advocate, and in crafting a queer and trans life that didn't and doesn't fit any scripted roles. No matter what the uh, underlying um, causes of my chronic illness across my life, um, I'm grateful there's never been anything truly life-threatening, but no matter what the root cause, I have a strange immune system that's too active in some ways and not vigilant enough in others. When I look back now, I can see how frequent bouts of viral and bacterial infections and relentless allergies, or what may be called today, mast cell activation syndrome, still not sure about that one, uh, changed so many things about my life and relationships, like frequently missing school. I can now see how being a sickly kid heightened the feelings of difference and fear of judgment I carried as someone who was already one of the few Jews in the community and was puzzled by gender expectations I didn't really identify with. I came into the HIV activist group ACT UP when I finished college in 1990. Um, I was starting to have glimmers of queerness that I'd long suppressed and was eager also to find ways to do good in the world around me. Then a friend brought me to an ACT UP meeting. I was put to work. Do you wanna work on this press release? What do you think should be our signs for the protest? This work was very hands-on. It was very much a loving, fierce queer community. There wasn't a question about whether to center people who were most effective uh, most affected because people living with HIV had started the group. It was an activist group that did things, but really at the heart, it was a community and a home. So that's always stayed with me, a community in struggle where there was room for and a role for everybody. For the first time in my life, I was around people for whom illness was the norm, not the exception. And in a way, difference itself was the norm. We were a crew of sick people and allies, queer people, current and former drug users, and others who were drawn together by a virus and a commitment to doing all we could to save each other, our loved ones, and our friends. I just want to take a couple more minutes to walk through a, my, a little bit more about myself and my health history. Um, I had my mid to late 20s, in addition to getting sick frequently with what seemed to be colds or run-of-the-mill illnesses and environmental allergies, I started having what I thought at the time was called chronic fatigue and chronic pain. It came and went. And then in my late thirties, um, I started having specific pains and my whole body went numb up to my neck one day in a matter of 24 hours. Uh, I had been bouncing between specialists for months to try and figure out what's going on. And in the coming um, years, I was diagnosed with clinically isolated syndrome, multiple sclerosis, neuromyelitis optica spectrum disorder or NMOSD and fibromyalgia. I did four years, I think, of rituximab after um, uh, several shorter uh, stints of ME medication. And in fact, went off rituximab about eight years ago because not really sure what I had. I was concerned about what would happen if there was a pandemic. I've been a bit of an early adopter. Um, in 2017, I got my ME diagnosis, um, thanks to uh, ME activist Terry Wilder, who encouraged me to see Dr. Susan Levine. But for all of these things, I'm atypical. I don't have autoantibodies to NMO. I don't have aglioclonal bands that many people have for multiple sclerosis. Uh, my orthostatic intolerance is wavering or unclear. And my relationship to PEM or post-exertion malaise still remains a little cryptic. And I feel very fortunate to have 
consistently mild to moderate presentation of what could be really, really severe conditions. I've had COVID, I had COVID for the first time as a good New Yorker in March of 2020. And then again in February and March of 2021, and both times changed or increased my chronic conditions. Um, and in some ways actually, I've had the fortune of learning about treatments from people with long COVID, such as those for mast cell activation syndrome that have made my brain fog much better and allowed me to be here with you today. However, I have more trouble finding words, which is um, making this presentation a little challenging right now. And among other um, mild but vexing syndromes, I've really lost my ability to sing, which was a big joy in my life. Okay, so next slide. So the Cranky Queer Guide to Chronic Illness was started, I started it right before the pandemic arrived based on the reality that queer and trans people have always had to find new paths for our survival. And in doing so, we have widened the options for everyone to live authentic lives as their whole selves. This is a photo of my mentor, Kiyoshi Kiramiya, one of my mentors in ACT UP in his last um, uh, civil disobedience protest in a, law, in a life of much um, advocacy across social movements and a protest at the US Trade Representative's Office fighting for global HIV treatment. Next slide. So um, after, as the, the um, pandemic was approaching, like many of you who are here today, I uh, was concerned about what this would mean for people who are already disabled and chronically ill. And I joined together with old and new friends to create a webinar that was held on March 7th, um, very early in the pandemic about concerns of people with chronic illnesses um, in the US. Next slide. Oh, and I should say, actually, if you could go back to that slide, I, I want to um, honor the powerful memory of Alandria Williams E, who was key in that, um, uh, this activity um, and who uh, we lost in the course of the, the pandemic. Um, and her or their organization, People's Hub, lives on to, as a really fantastic resource for chronically ill and disabled people in social movements um, and bringing together people from other movements. Next slide. Um, I went on to write about how to have sex in the pandemic based on my, all of our best guesses, and then did other things, including a report that I'll cite from today, Chronic Injustice, Centering, in, centering Equitable Healthcare and Policies for COVID-19 and Other Chronic Conditions. Um, that art is uh, by Pato Hebert, who's a person uh, living with long COVID, who's an HIV activist. Next slide. And then went on to found strategies for high impact, um, which looks to take um, some of what we have learned from HIV activism, disability justice, and other really important movements to um, as all chronically ill and disabled people uh, coming together to see what we can do to create the changes we need today through mobilization, coalition building, organizational development, and strategic communications. We founded the uh, Network for Long COVID Justice late last year. And um, one of the things we've done so far is release the Pandemics Are, Are Chronic Pledge, which I invite you to sign at tinyurl.com slash pandemics are chronic. And um, all of my, what I'll be speaking about today has been shaped and influenced by people with long COVID and other chronically ill and disabled people um, working to, to confront the challenges and seize the opportunities of today. However, any mistakes or lapses are all on me and I'm not speaking on behalf of anyone else or for the network uh, for long COVID justice. If you think this work um, is something you'd like to support, you, we, uh, I would be remiss to not encourage you to donate to us through our fiscal sponsor, Springboard Health Lab, through that link, tinyurl.com slash LCJ donate. And I'll put that up at the end too. Next slide. One thing I'm really excited about um, in the, the Network for Long COVID Justice is our strategy circle, which is made up by five organizations that are led by or accountable to people with long COVID and complex chronic illnesses. So on the, the top left, that rainbow is um, the patient led research collaborative of which I am a, a contributing partner. In the middle is ME Action. Um, on the right is Body Politic. Uh, which is a large international support group uh, based on Slack for uh, people with long COVID. 
um, the COVID-19 Long Haulers Advocacy Project started on um, Facebook and is a vibrant um, advocacy movement that's particularly focusing on federal initiatives to bring resources and support to long haulers. And Marked by COVID is a organization founded by um, the daughter of um, a man named Mark who was uh, killed by COVID and in his memory um, is joining together survivors, people with long COVID and others to fight for um, in the memory of those we have lost for the justice that we need. Next slide. Um, so here's how you can support that work. I already asked for the donation. Uh, we encourage you to donate, uh, to endorse uh, the pledge, the Pandemics Are Chronic pledge, and you can contact us at hello at longcovidjustice.org. Next slide. So this moment, finally to this moment, is a moment of challenge and opportunity for health equity. And that's why we're here today. And I, I really appreciate you taking the time to be here today, whether you're on live or reviewing this afterwards. I know that your time is really important. Thank you. Next slide. We're at an unprecedented moment of challenge and opportunity for shifting power to address the crisis in care for complex chronic conditions, including long COVID and associated conditions, LCAC, such as ME. And by what I talk about today, um, it will be clear that I um, advocate for us to pursue a interconnected dual strategy to build mass movements for justice and uh, resources for complex chronic conditions while persisting in the detailed and specific work for research, medical care, and support for people with specific syndromes, conditions, or symptoms, uh, including ME. So to do so, we can and must build a large scale health equity movement that is rooted in racial, gender, and disability justice, that invests in political education and mobilization, and that reframes narratives on complex chronic conditions to reach mass scope and high impact results. Next slide. I'd like to um, interject um, with the words of Aurora Levin Morales, um, who is a Puerto Rican Jewish poet um, and activist living with multiple chronic conditions uh, to give some context for the, the challenges we face. There is no neutral body from which our bodies deviate. Society has written deep into each strand of tissue of every living person on earth. What it writes into the heart muscles of five-star generals is distinct from what it writes into the pancreatic tissue and intestinal tracts of black single mothers in Detroit, Mexicana migrants in Fresno, but no body stands outside the consequences of injustice and inequality. What our bodies require in order to thrive is what the world requires. If there is a map to get there, it can be found in the atlas of our skin and bones and blood, in the tracks of neurotransmitters and, auto and antibodies. Next slide. So when we look at the moment today, there's a few possible outcomes. A positive one where the long COVID crisis wakes up the nation and infrastructure and resources are marshaled to meet the urgent needs of millions with chronic illnesses alongside those with long COVID but also imaginable is a future where attempts to downplay and deny long COVID prevail, which would, both unjust, which would be both unjust and potentially deeply harmful to efforts for recognition of invisible disabilities and complex chronic conditions and more. But also disturbing would be an outcome that legitimates, validates and sets up long COVID as a profit center for medical disaster capitalism while other disabled people and people with chronic, complex chronic conditions remain marginalized. Next slide. So I'd like to talk about uh, moving from disability rights to disability justice. Next slide. Um, this is a, a, a poster um, featuring Leroy F. Moore Jr., one of the um, originators of uh, and contributors to the disability justice movement. It reads, all bodies are unique and essential. All bodies are whole. All bodies have strengths and needs that must be met. We are powerful, not despite the complexities of our bodies, but because of them. We move together with no body left behind. This is disability justice. Uh, for the next series of slides, I quote from Patty Byrne, um, another one of the, um, the uh, early leaders and, and continuing leaders of the disability justice movement. 
um, from the disability justice primer put out by Sins Invalid, a very important central disability justice group. In 2005, disabled queers and activists of color began discussing a second wave of disability rights. Many of these first conversations happened between Patty Byrne and Mia Mingus, two queer disabled women of color who were incubated in progressive and radical movements which had failed to address ableism in their politics. Their visioning soon expanded to include others, including Leroy Moore, Stacey Milburn, um, who uh, died in the last year, Eli Clare and Sebastian uh, Margaret, 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 thank you. Next slide, please. At its core, the disability rights framework centers people who can achieve status, power and access through legal or rights-based frameworks, which we know is not possible for many disabled people or appropriate for all situations. I should say that in the book, this is prefaced by you know, ex explanation of the power and importance of the disability rights movement, which fought for um, the legal rights that had not existed for disabled people. Next slide. The political strategy of the disability rights movement um, relied on litigation and the establishment of a disability bureaucratic center at the expense of developing a broad popular based movement. Popular movements also began when people developed political consciousnesses and named their experiences. Right based strategies often address the systems of inequity, but not the root. The root of disability oppression is ableism, and we must work to understand it, combat it, and create alternative practices rooted in justice. And I will add that it's not as if it were not enough that we need to go to this route of ableism in order to, um, to reach a greater level of justice. I believe that we will really be hampered and even trying to achieve the kinds of legal or rights-based approaches um, that, we, that we currently lack um, or the, um, the understanding that would allow us to grow to the mass scale to win what we need in a increasingly uh, disabling society if we don't really change the, uh, the understanding of ableism. Next slide. Um, while a concrete and ra radical move forward towards justice for disabled people, the disability rights movement simultaneously invisibilized the lives of disabled people of color and many other groups as she goes on to talk about. Next slide. Our communities are treated as disposable. And I think that's something we're really seeing uh, a, a broader range of people are seeing now uh, the kind of marginal, willful marginalization of disabled and chronically ill people is now affecting more and more people with as we are at this stage of the COVID-19 pandemic where we've basically been told to fend for ourselves. Next slide. So, We've also heard a term used a lot over the last couple of years called health equity. So I wanted to go in a little bit to talk about what really is health equity. And in the chronic injustice uh, report, we use a definition of health equity that was developed in uh, 2003 um, when ministers of health from Chile, Germany, Greece, New Zealand, Slovenia, Sweden, and the UK met to figure out how to make uh, equitable access to good quality healthcare how to put it into action and how to um, have a shared specific definition for equitable access to order in order to plan and evaluate their efforts. Next slide. So a couple of people, uh, Dr. Oliver and Mosialos at the London School of Economics published this definition of equity in healthcare that wanted to create it into a, from a principle to a useful operational policy objective. And I find it really useful because it looks at four different aspects equal access to healthcare for those in equal need of healthcare, equal utilization of healthcare for those in need of equal healthcare, equal or rather equitable health outcomes as measured by, for uh, example, quality adjusted life expectancy and equal access for equal need, recognizing that it requires conditions whereby those with equal needs have equal opportunities to access healthcare which they call horizontal equity. And as a corollary, those with unequal needs have appropriately unequal opportunities to access healthcare, that is vertical equity. So all people who have a health need 
have equal access to access the care. And those who have the greatest needs have the greatest opportunities for access. Next slide. So that put me in mind actually of some things that, that um, were principles and, and campaigns um, in early HIV activism, which I'll talk more about shortly. So um, this poster, all people with AIDS are innocent, was put out as a counterbalance to sort of the public dialogue about how if a, if a child was born uh, with HIV, that they were um, an innocent victim because they had done nothing to sort of bring it upon themselves. And it was extremely important to assert that actually all people with AIDS are innocent. No one um, is more or less deserving of a disease and also no one then is more or less deserving of care. This um, bus shelter has an ad that was put out by Grand Fury who did both of these graphics, which is a collective that, that did many of the graphics associated with the ACT UP movement, particularly ACT UP New York. Women don't get AIDS, they just die from it. This is um, because there was a uh, hard won campaign to change the definition of AIDS, which had opportunist, was made up of opportunistic infections that were seen most frequently in men and non-injection drug users. So um, the, the definition, no one necessarily wanted to have a definition of AIDS if they were living with HIV, but what it meant was people had access to being in research, access to services, access to things like housing or benefits where you were required to have an AIDS diagnosis. So the truth of it is, is that women were dying of AIDS without being able to sort of claim the term that would help them have resources to be able to live. Uh, so that's an example of health inequities. Next slide. So health equity in this crisis requires an approach inclusive of long COVID and all its associated conditions. And by associated conditions, I mean all complex chronic conditions that can be triggered or exacerbated by viruses, infections, or traumas. That definition of that four point definition of health equity, however, it brings us to this point. So for example, my pre-COVID life-changing fatigue is no less or was no less deserving of treatment than my post-COVID exacerbation of mast cell activation syndrome. And as a white professional class urban health activist covered by my spouse's workplace insurance, I am no more deserving of treatment than a low income raised working class black service worker on a Medicaid plan. But also, and I think this can be, you know, hard to, hard to accept, but I, I believe it's key to us really living out health equity, and is also a strategic way to proceed in our campaigns for comprehensive care for all chronic conditions. I am also no more deserving of care than a Trump voter who is not vaccinated for COVID-19, who now has post-viral illness. Next slide, please. So I'd like to go back and talk a little bit about the HIV movement, which I like to talk about a lot, but I'm gonna try and keep it uh, as succinct as possible. Next slide, please. These are some pic early pictures from ACT UP Philadelphia, um, a group that I was uh, actively a part of for about 13 years, um, that has our own trajectory, history, and, and victories that aren't necessarily known in the sort of AIDS, AIDS activist pantheon that's largely centered in the work of ACT UP New York. Um, so um, when people, when the HIV pandemic arose, and again, this is mass oversimplification, um, it drew together uh, new interpersonal and institutional alliances from people who knew, now had newfound affinity for one another because they were either um, affected directly by HIV or sort of tainted with the brush of stigma. Um, it was rooted in love and anger and brought forth many different practices of mutual aid, self-care, community care, um, what we may now call uh, being a doula or helping people with transitions and also pleasure activism of fighting for the resources that people need to, lead, to, to live and then going out together and flirting and having sex and living life together with joy as much as possible. In ACT UP Philadelphia, we created a standard of care for HIV disease because the government didn't have one. And it was a fourfold um, uh, copy, you know, photocopied, sheet that people could bring with them to the doctor. That's sort of a uh, predecessor of what um, people can do now today of, of sharing information in the, the patient-led 
um, well-run COVID, uh, long COVID support group. We put out 13 editions of that standard of care, um, updating it as needed uh, before the government had its own. Um, and we, um, while there were uh, many newfound alliances, such as long-term activists from civil rights movements, um, uh, different liberation movements, unionization, uh, uh, the women and lesbian healthcare mo health movement. There were also challenges to center people who are historically marginalized, um, including black and brown people um, and uh, uh, active drug users, sex workers. Um, and the, for those who there may be barriers to participation because of time, energy, health status. However, there's a lot of lost history of um, the work that went into and the, all the people who are involved in issues like syringe exchange and harm reduction um, and uh, the, the caucuses and actions led by black and brown people living with HIV and allies. Um, next slide. Um, ACT UP Philadelphia had a very active role in fighting for global HIV treatment um, and starting a, helping to start a group called Health Gap and using slogans and narrative shifting uh, on issues like pills cost penny, greed's, greed costs lives. And I'll, I'll talk more about that. Next slide. Um, and what AIDS activists won was the creation of a panoply of federal uh, and then state and locally supported and now international programs to deal with HIV. So I'll talk about these in a second. I just did wanna say a couple things first to set in the context of HIV activism. So maybe go back to the, the last slide for a moment. Um, we, uh, with all that we did, it was, it was in some ways, many street beta activist movements remain very ableist. I like to give the example that when we would write press releases, whoever could stay up late enough could maybe you know, get to determine the final version. And I had to go to bed earlier. Um, at some of the, the touted victories of AIDS activism, like the faster development of HIV drugs were done in, you know, a kind of an unholy alliance with what actually helped pharmaceutical companies because then they could get their drugs to market and make money faster. So it's important to look at sort of the roots and the, the power map of why some of these victories happen. Um, some of people who sort of weren't seen and accounted for that led to some troubling inequities in HIV services that can still persist today is actually folks who were the most disabled. So for example, there were community planning sessions that were set up to determine the priorities for allocating federal money that rarely mentioned the need for skilled nursing care because the folks in skilled nursing care weren't there. In today's HIV sector, we see there's been a... Um, a push from aging long-term survivors of HIV saying that they are sort of being, had been abandoned by the movement they innovated and to a time where many are experiencing consequences of aging more rapidly, um, experiencing health conditions in their 50s, 60s, 70s that often appear later in life and actually having complex chronic conditions like frailty that can uh, require a lot of support to be able to uh, avoid getting isolated and having a lot of serious repercussions. Okay, next next slide, please. So we have this, uh, this broad framework of HIV services that have supported and supported um, in a time where we still don't have real national healthcare in the United States. Um, and that even goes internationally, such as that, that USAID um, logo I put up is uh, where they run PEPFAR, the, pe the Presidential Emergency Plan for HIV AIDS Relief. There's housing programs, uh, there's wraparound services to compensate for where people don't have medical care and to extend medical care that costs more than happens in a standard insured or uninsured office visit. And the National Institutes of Health, the Office of AIDS Research was won in 1990 by AIDS activists who insisted that money coming for AIDS research needed to be centralized and be reallocated across NIH for strategic purposes, not just walked around to pet projects may believe that's made a tremendous difference. Next slide. Um, we won the, despite all the, the, the resources there were for HIV, we had no central strategy. So um, we won the creation in Obama's first year of the National HIV AIDS Strategy. Uh, it's now in its, I believe, fourth iteration. This is the current, the cover of the current version. And here's a picture where a bunch of us went to the, the White House for it to launch and my bow tie was crooked. Next slide. 
Today, there are vibrant national networks of people living with HIV with whom I have the privilege to work. Um, they are rooted in intersectional MIPA. And what that means is MIPA stands for the meaningful involvement of people with HIV AIDS. Not just that you have a couple people with HIV who are your friends on your board of directors or um, giving uh, uh, advice on a community advisory board for research, but that it's meaningful, that they, they, it's empowered, that people have uh, the rights and standings of other people that are on boards, bodies, or committees. And that it's not just um, any people living with HIV, that it's people who are representative of the pandemic. So which um, is majority uh, people of color, which is disproportionately gay and uh, trans people, um, and which includes people who are drug users, sex workers, and others, and uh, immigrants and others. Next slide. Um, there's also the matter of funding. Despite the, that there's always a need, could be more, there's the HIV sector is relatively well-funded. And it's important to note, this is uh, uh, from Funders Concerned About AIDS report, that there's a large influence of, uh, this is international funding, but this is uh, in domestic funding, even maybe more stark in some ways. Uh, Gilead Sciences and Vive Healthcare um, are the top funders by the number of grants. Those are the two, two uh, HIV drug companies. Um, and so even the advocacy groups that I love and I'm a part of uh, that uh, supporting the national networks of living with HIV um, are drug company funded and some see it as reparations. And it's very important that groups are not bound by the companies of what they're doing with those dollars. Next slide. Also, the HIV community has been profoundly affected by COVID and long COVID, and that's why we're, we're organizing in the community. I'm going to start moving more quickly to get through these slides, but uh, so next slide. Uh, we do know that there's emerging data that there may be higher risks of long COVID in people with HIV than people without HIV. This is just to show that um, the HIV uh, in the United States is disproportionately among Black uh, African Americans and Hispanic Latin and Latinx people. Um, and if you look at trans people, it's even more so. Next slide. So when we look at how we are uh, building uh, support for and advocacy by people with long COVID, um, I suggest that we look we can, all across society where we have people who already are oriented towards thinking about healthcare. Um, and systems of advocacy, and where we are seeing people who are disproportionately affected by bias and marginalization. And if we look at the HIV community, I believe that's one of the places we should start. So we've started there. Next slide. We have a program called Resourcing the HIV Community to Face COVID and Long COVID in 2022. It has a bunch of objectives and a bunch of um, sponsors. Next slide. We have a pilot sample that we've completed. The uh, primary investigator is my comrade, Gabriel San Amaterio, who's the co-founder of Long COVID Justice, that we found that um, uh, it has uh, people from 25 states, seven in 10 are living with HIV. The others are identified with the HIV community um, as family members or care providers. Um, and you'll see that um, uh, almost 60% are disabled or sometimes affected but have hesitant to claim a disabled identity. Um, and that's even higher in our cohort of people living with HIV in which 70, almost 75% have chronic conditions other than HIV and 70% identify um, at least to themselves as disabled. Next slide. Um, so HIV organizations are a place to start organizing that are at mass scale that understand the complexities of uh, disease, if not enough about complex chronic conditions themselves, and who are seeing the impact of this current pan, the, this new pandemic on the pandemic that's still ongoing because they don't uh, have access to the information they need. Um, there's a risk to support for HIV programs. And of course, services were tremendously disrupted. And um, those who are most affected are those who have comorbidities, frailty, or dis difficulty accessing services. Next slide. Um, and, and importantly, about 22% identified as living with COVID, which we defined as long-term health effects of COVID-19. Next slide. Um, 
We found a need for much more information, high rates of concern about the impact of COVID in people living with HIV and the impact of long COVID. Look at those rates over uh, almost 90% in both cases. People need to need much more information and support and are ready to kind of be the grassroots of a, a cross disease initiative, cross condition initiative. Next slide. So to strategies and interventions, uh, narrative shifting. Next slide. How the reality of long COVID is framed can be leveraged and course corrected in a way that advances not only the national dialogue about long COVID, but builds support for all people with, with chronic illnesses. Next slide. We shifted the narrative in HIV and now 28 million people around the world are accessing HIV treatment. Next slide. Um, I'm going to skip these two slides. You can forward to between these slides, but there's risks to having increased stories about long COVID without us shifting the narrative. So one of the things we're doing to shift the narrative is the pandemics are chronic pledge. Um, just saying pandemics are chronic is something we're doing to create a greater context for understanding that it's actually common, not rare, that something like long COVID would be happening. Next slide. But as we do so, um, we're talking about ending practices and policies that ignore and further marginalize dis and disabled and chronically ill people. Next slide. So um, our pledge asks people to join in four facets of narrative shifting, to include long COVID and associated conditions in the narrative of the pandemic. We saw that even those who had been allies or longtime AIDS activists were talking a lot uh, as in the news about COVID without discussing long COVID. And that people should be, we need MIPA for long COVID and for complex chronic conditions where people who are living with these conditions who represent populations affected are at the center of talking about them and empowered to decide what should happen. Um, we need to end the marginalization of all disabled and chronically ill people and to recognize that the COVID-19 pandemic as well as long COVID associated conditions have disproportionately impacted already marginalized communities including black, brown, indigenous communities. Next slide. So uh, next up, what we're looking for is resources as uh, the national network to um, use narrative communication specialists and media wranglers to have resources for polling and message testing to see what descriptions and language work for those who may not be as familiar with what our situation is and centering our own dis experiences, descriptions and research. And most importantly, perhaps, we have a plan that not only would put people with long COVID and associated conditions as spokespeople and narrative creators, but to do so in a way where we learn to do it while, while safeguarding our own and each other's health. How do we take care of each other while we're doing these things? Next slide. The next intervention is building the advocacy base. Next slide. Next slide. So we're looking to fund leadership and help build structure, coaching, capacity building, and organizational development for both the new organizations that have started with long COVID and for complex chronic condition groups that have long struggled for resources. One thing we're, we're hoping to do with your help is paid fellowships for black, brown, and indigenous people with complex chronic conditions, as well as for those who are associated with organizations to give resources to their organizations. Because if we just fund individuals, sometimes that can detract from organizational stability. Um, I like to talk about recreating the multi-spout funnel of HIV activism. So imagine a funnel, it's big at the top, and at the bottom, instead of just one spout, there's lots of spouts. So you get to be in community together in that funnel and be less isolated. And then when it comes down to specializing or, or being in affinity groups, working together, you get to meet up with people who have common interests or common skills that you wanna develop and design something that's best for you to work on. It's not just one size fits all for how to be an advocate. It fits who you are, what you like, and how you wanna grow. And also, of course, it fits your, um, uh, what we need in terms of our ability, our energy, and our health. Next slide. Um, we need to have roles for everybody. Um, that means if someone, like for example, in Millions Missing, the international mobilization that's happening online in May and in person in September, that we are saying we're doing it in the streets and from our beds and all is important. 
We need to model accessibility in our own work and advocacy with job sharing, flexibility, and figuring out how to take our precious minutes of energy in ways that actually are the most meaningful uh, in changing the um, conditions that affect our lives. There's a need for political education so people can come together with a shared understanding of what impacts our lives and clear messaging. Ilder is a term that um, I started with cranky queer that we're continuing to use that talks to that's about those of us of any age who gain wisdom through our chronic condition and, and by being disabled. And how do we share that with others where we center ourselves as the expert? How do we shift to disability justice that um, is about um, that society disables us in many ways and that what's happening to us and our disabilities is also happening and affected by broader issues of climate change, um, economics and capitalism. And we have a series where we're doing interviews with leaders from ACT UP Philadelphia to talk about what they learned from that experience and how they could apply that to our struggles of today. Next slide. Um, as you can see, we're interested in co-creating the future with large scale stakeholders, such as the large HIV sector. Um, we're working on uh, launching a week of interfaith action on long COVID and associated conditions. where We can walk, work across denominations and across um, structures of different religions, which have been a base for um, creating more options of support and community compassion and advocacy for people with HIV, for social justice movements um, for a long time and always being vigilant of fighting for meaningful involvement of the most impacted, whether we're doing inside advocacy, such as seeking to be patient leaders at the Recover Initiative on long COVID or outside advocacy as far as um, outside pressure to build the power for change. And always, what is our spectrum of accessible programs and tactics? You know, the Affordable Care Act would not have passed if it wasn't for people living with HIV and disabled people in wheelchairs who took over Congress. There's many ways we can be powerful that don't require leaving our homes. And there's many ways that we can work as and across people with disabled and chronic conditions that allow us to be as powerful as we are in changing, um, changing the, the the narrative as well as the policies and the funding that affects our lives. All social movements are struggling now with what is effective protest and dissent in this COVID era. And that's why by joining with them, we can find ways to move forward that are both powerful and less ableist. Next slide. And then uh, last is making the big asks. As I said, next slide, as I said in the beginning, um, I'm encouraging us to look sort of at two levels. One is these sort of big picture, big tent approaches while continuing to hone in on what we need for specific conditions uh, in terms of research um, and support. So the um, Carry Across Generations campaign, uh, which fights for, um, for resources for home care workers, uh, talked about industrial strength solutions. These are big issues and big problems. We need umbrella solutions that cut across conditions, centering those most marginalized by systems of care and economic supports, and that contribute to a caring economy where every, all of us give and all of us receive care. That's the center of really, I think, what it means to be alive, not about making profit and not about um, other things. So how do we situate our work in the context of just tradition, tra transitions to a green economy, to combating climate change? How do we look at holistic, comprehensive models of interrelationships, how disabled and sick people have always cared for one another? Um, how we can challenge the market forces. You know, the, the, the conventional wisdom was like, there was never gonna be HIV treatment for African nations, even when there were peoples whose life it was saving in the United States. People said, oh, public health professionals said, and politicians said, we're gonna lose a generation. All we can invest in is prevention. What we knew pills cost pennies and greed cost lives. And we turned that around and there's 28 million people on care today. And centering the real life experiences of our grief and our loss, that speak to, so we can be in movements that support us as humans going through human experiences, not as just a means to an end. Let, second is community led solutions. I would like to see uh, people who have complex chronic conditions being able to be paid to support one another as living wage jobs and sustaining mutual aid and, and cooperative economies, for example, for supplement access, that because there's many people who may discuss all the things that may be promising for staying healthy with long COVID and they're utterly unaffordable and out of reach to most people who are chronically ill and disabled. 
And as I said, our specific solutions, which the many fine speakers in this series, such as Dr. Jansen last week have talked about that we need to do, for example, for ME. Next slide. Um, structural changes for complex chronic care. Uh, this will be very quick and then we'll have a few minutes to talk. And we, I've been told we, we are able to go over for those who can hang out with us for a little while longer for conversation. Next slide. Adapt and improving on the best of the HIV model. So there's details in here that you'll be able to download. Next slide. There's components of the national HIV response that are essential to supplementing what will never work uh, you know, in a, in a fee-for-service or insurance-based scheme. Even if we had single-payer universal healthcare in the United States today, we would not have what we need for complex chronic conditions. Next slide. We need to redesign chronic care. Um, Arch and others have an excellent proposal for centers of excellence for long COVID and ME, and that could be broadened to for all complex chronic conditions. I would like to see centers of excellence for fatigue. As I've been insinuating, we also I believe we need to have service for services and care for complex chronic conditions where people don't have to identify with an unfortunately politicized illness. I want people to get treatment and be able to get long treat COVID treatment. I want people to get treatment for fatigue, no matter why they have fatigue, even if they, they don't necessarily identify with a root cause, or even if the root cause may not be discernible. Next slide. And that's what I'm calling cause or diagnosis neutral care for true health equity, providing deeply accessible care that acknowledges social, social cultural and political barriers, such as identifying with or accepting a COVID related diagnosis and removing explicit and implicit barriers that can come from diagnosis based exclusion and exclusion, like when the, there was a definition of AIDS that excluded women and injection drug users, or now when there's um, long COVID clinics that are excluding people who don't have a history of a positive COVID test. The bottom line is to support health equity for all people with conditions or symptoms, regardless of cause or even having known cause. Next slide. Here's a, um, some resources that you can find online. Uh, and these are active links for when you get the, the slides. Next slide. And um, here's that slide again about how to contact us and donate. Thank you. Uh, I really appreciate your time and the opportunity to be here today. And what I'm most interested in is dialogue, which you may find hard to believe after all those slides, but I'm eager to continue this conversation however we can as we move forward together to build our movements. Thank you. Okay, thank you, JD. I'd like to remind everybody that you can submit questions uh, to the chat. Okay, so, uh, okay, so first question, can you address funding by ally groups such as AMFAR in terms of funding AIDS? Yeah, sure. So AMFAR is the American Foundation for AIDS Research. Uh, some people may re recall that it was started by and supported by Elizabeth Taylor. Um, and so AMFAR's uh, operated and continues to operate in a number of ways. Um, they provided money to, to start research, you know, and then uh, to encourage that scale up by NIH um, and to adapt, uh, to address gaps and to fund young investigators, things that, that NIH doesn't do much of. And they've also done a lot of policy work. For years, um, AMFAR funded uh, syringe exchange groups and supported um, efforts to lift the federal funding ban on syringe exchange. Um, and those kinds of uh, uh, entities that can lend support um, and bring in resources and have someone who's, you know, uh, very high profile like Elizabeth Taylor show that she's spending her resources on this and bring in her, her peers is, can be really important. However, that is not a substitute though for the patient accountability, what they call, what people have been calling long COVID patient led and the HIV community uh, people call, you know, MEPA or community led as far as who is making the decisions at AMFAR right? Um, who is making decisions, all these organizations about the best use of funds needs to include people who are um, living with the conditions. See, there's a question about um, what individuals and small groups can do to make a difference. Oh, yeah. Why don't you go ahead and answer that? And then yeah, I'll have that's a great question. question. 
Yeah, um, and I'll, I'll try to answer quickly on a couple of levels. Well, one is join groups, um, join existing groups and ask how you can help. Right now, um, for example, if you sign our pandemics or chronic pledge, you'll be in the loop as we continue to grow the network for long COVID justice. There's Millions Missing is a uh, longstanding international effort that's coordinated by ME Action, which um, uh, is a way that individuals can affiliate or form small groups where you live that could, or big groups um, that could put together an action um, and get the messaging out that is shared. Um, one thing that I would encourage people to do right now that if you uh, um, would like to is to monitor the media um, and when they're covering COVID without mentioning long COVID, um, speak out about it online if you're on social media, write to the, uh, send emails or write on Twitter to the um, reporters um, or to if you know the editors or who runs the publications and explain that it's important to contextualize the that what normal is, I've been saying cr complex chronic conditions are the new normal, right? And that, that this needs to be included in the story of COVID. Uh, and that what's in that story is that many of us have had these um, complex chronic conditions for a long time, uh, as well as when there's coverage of long COVID that all is focused on people who are quote unquote healthy and now whose lives are quote unquote ruined, you know, not at all to, to detract from how horrible that is. And many of us have lived through that in different times. Um, but to say that um, health equity applies to people who get long COVID who were already sick and disabled and who, who is affecting us um, in those ways as well. Those are some ideas, but I'd love to talk further about any of it. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, so with society sort of tired of having dealt with COVID for the last couple of years. You know, cu current government policy is to rely on vaccination to minimize severe cases of the disease while removing mask mandates and not being as concerned with the milder cases. Some view this as ableism as chronically ill people have the choice of totally sheltering or risking illness through participating with unmasked and some unvaccinated people. What policies would you recommend in the name of health equity? Uh, that's, that's a big question. Thank you for that great question. I think that um, in terms of health equity, some of it does get back to um, also to me, To I'm a narrative and communications person. And I think the misunderstanding about vaccines is tremendous. I, I think we were sort of the, the push to centralize everything in a biomedical solution of vaccines misled people into thinking that it's okay to be vaccinated and not have a mask. So first I would say in terms of health equity is that um, uh, the more we could tell the stories of what it means literally to people who now cannot participate and go outside safely um, through personal connections, spiraling outwards from there to create that understanding for those who are able to do so, I think could be an effective way through storytelling to start disseminating the, the words. Um, in terms of, I mean, I, I don't wanna go into like the policies necessarily, cause I'm sure I agree with many people on this call that the policies we should have should center disabled and chronically ill people um, to be able to, for example, have everyone in society have a universal basic income so they could stay home. The complexities of having to go out and work and force other people to come to come into your restaurant to wear masks and all those things are very, very deep and intense. And if you need to do that stuff to keep your family afloat, you're going to have to go out and work and you're going to have to be confronted by people not wearing masks and all of this. So a lot of it starts with advocating for the policies like excluded worker funds and universal basic incomes that allow people to live healthy lives during pandemics. So there's a lot, there's a lot there um, to talk about, but I think going back to those four ways of looking at health equity to ask about policies is a great place to start. In the um, chronic injustice report, we talk about using a equity access framework for evaluating policies. And there's an example of an equity access framework uh, toolkit in there about COVID policies that was put out by um, human impact partners, I think, that you can get through there. Okay. We're going we're gonna to keep going with questions, but I just wanted to remind those people who, who need to leave that this is being recorded, uh, but you're all welcome to stay because we're going to go a few more minutes. Great. There's a lot of questions here. So 
given that most people with ME-CFS are not diagnosed and of the minority who are, they are often homebound and severely limited in advocating. So what do you suggest as good ways to reach and engage these people? Yeah, that's a great question. Thank you. I'd love to, for us to all have a time to talk more about that for an hour or two. Uh, some quick things I will say. <laughs> First is, again, reaching out and saying, are you tired? Do you not have energy? Like to be able to speak about in colloquial ways about what the symptoms are of ME, to be able to reach people who aren't diagnosed and aren't likely to get diagnosed anytime soon because it is so limited, to say that we all have a common cause to talk about um, what we need with a complex chronic, you may have a complex chronic condition and here's some things that are helped and here's some things we need to do. Here's how you can participate online. Um, here's what you can give to family members and friends who may like to support. Um, when we have our Interfaith Week of Action, we're going to talk with religious congregations about how to support your community members who may or may not have a diagnosis, you know, and I think that we're in this important moment now of whether people have a formal diagnosis of co long COVID or not, to speak about what it means to have be on the spectrum of fatiguing illnesses. People think fatigue means you're tired, right? I know I just said that as a way in, but it also means you know, for me and many of you who may be on this session today, um, queasiness, dizziness, low self-esteem, fear of failure. There's so much, such a blend of what goes into my fatigue. Um, and to be able to talk to people about, you may be having these feelings, it may or may not be ME, but if it is, here's stop, rest, pace. And here's what we can do to help everybody who may have ME and other and long COVID and other conditions. I also think working through groups where people are already organized socially, if not politically, or maybe politically, to say, how are you feeling? And how are you feeling after three, two, two and a half years of this pandemic? All what we need the, the, the government to be doing is case finding. And we need to push for, and there are some you know, policy forces that are pushing for having like uni more universal screening opportunities for people to say, how are you doing, whether you had a positive COVID test or not, everyone should be able to get their heart, brain and lungs checked in a way that's accessible to them, including through home assessment if needed. And then to also be asking about complex chronic conditions, even in their mild form, because as we know, those of us who are here today, you know, having mild ME is profound. Um, and I'm very grateful to have mild ME, but I want more people with mild ME to be able to get diagnosed without having the level of privilege I have to be able to adapt our lives and educate those around us about how to have society's impact to be less disabling. Um, so I, I, I think more talk about our lives and what they're like, um, and including being able to say for those of us who have more mild disease that we're grateful for it, but to really talk about what it means for us, those of us who can be able to do that without losing our jobs, our income, our children, or our lives. Not everyone can. I think the issues of the, the, the reasons why people with HIV need confidentiality and um, an anonymity are different, but there's an incredibly big need that's not being recognized based on stigma, uh, potential loss and violences for needing to have anonymity and confidentiality for care for complex chronic conditions. Okay, another question. This is something I can resonate with because uh, as an advocate, you know, given the numbers of people who have ME, there seem to be relatively few volunteers. So I'm wondering what ideas you might have, strategies for getting healthy people more involved in ME groups and ME advocacy, because obviously they could be in a position to do a lot more than those who are, are ill with ME. Yeah, I think there's a couple of ways we need to look at this. One is about um, reach uh, and opportunities, and the other is sort of about power and voice. So as far as reach and opportunities, um, I do think it's important to acknowledge that um, someone in contradistinction to, to HIV, um, overactivity, activity, you know, activism, righteous activism causes post-exertion malaise and could cause progression of conditions. And I'm concerned about 
people with long COVID who are throwing themselves into advocacy, who I love to, that may be, you know, making it harder to heal. And so it's really an acute need that, you know, what I experienced in the pre-effective pre treatment um, days of HIV, which was very tragic, people would be pretty functional and healthy until the disease progressed and then they weren't, but there wasn't this sort of clear progression where the work, overworking itself could actually be harmful. So I think we need to be honest about that. And we need to reach out and say, you know, there's a, a hashtag masking for a friend, encouraging people to keep their masks on for others, um, marching for a friend, protesting for a friend, petitioning for a friend. There's groups that project large scale light images as a uh, as a part of protests in the at the night, you know, and we could have protests where we're pro we're um, projecting the photos of those of us who can't come in person who are there and make sure that we're live streaming and making sure we can be there um, it, at least to see what's going on whenever possible. Those kinds of things, specifically having opportunities and resources like a, um, a worksheet and education tools that you could use to say, I'm forming a group of five support people who will engage in advocacy where they will check off what they want to do on behalf of me as a person with complex chronic conditions. I would broaden past ME, honestly, because it is so underdiagnosed and because there's so many things that we all need. We need home care. We need um, re help with understanding fatigue. We need um, access to disability funding and disability funding be better. We have all these things in common cause. To be honest, most of us need help with digestion, food. There's so many things. And so we could be forming broader alliances with others who all can work together to have friends and family be involved and, and in ways that fit with our existing relationships. So union locals could support uh, you, their union members who are on disability now or seeking to get disability from long COVID. Again, religious institutions, schools. Um, in terms of power and um, voice, I do think though it's important that people living with the conditions have the opportunity to give input on what are the messages? What are the demands? What are you saying or not saying about what we want or what our lives are like speaking for ourselves and not even speaking for each other sometimes, you know, I mean, so uh, I don't agree with every person with ME, they don't agree with me. And I am, you know, a white middle-class person and my voice is limited to my experience. So I think setting up structures where when people are, it's not whoever stays up late finalizes the press release. It's where we have formal structures of accountability, maybe looking at what's been innovated in the HIV movement, for example, where people are, um, able to you know, kind of call the shots and say what they want to have happen and not happen, even if they're not the ones who are going to a meeting, even if they're not the ones in street bait protests, et cetera. Okay, thank you. So have ACT UP and other AIDS advocacy organizations been active in protesting the uh, end of COVID protections worldwide? And if so, what types of actions have they been involved with? Um, I can't speak for the groups I'm not in. I think like many um, different kinds of organizations and uh, issue-based groups um, that there's been a lot getting in the way of some groups being able to do everything they need to do during the pandemic and there's tremendous strain going on. Um, I know that uh, ACT UP New York and ACT UP Philadelphia signed on to and then have endorsed our work uh, for resourcing the HIV community to face COVID and long COVID in 2020. Um, and um, have been, uh, I know that there's the COVID-19 Working Group of New York, for example, ACT UP New York has been a very active part of that. Um, so I can't say specifically about global um, ends of COVID protections. Um, I do know that also in terms of the HIV service sector, it's been a tremendous undertaking to be able to get people to care and information and to combat the isolation that they're experiencing as particularly as some of the older people living with HIV um, during the pandemic became very isolated and re frankly re-traumatized. Um, uh, in terms of uh, uh, recollections of an earlier pandemic and people who have experienced so much loss. There's also many people living with HIV who have long COVID. And I suspect, you know, again, I think it may be even be more likely to be misdiagnosed or not diagnosed in them because they'll be told, oh, it's just your HIV or, oh, you've been isolated. Mm -hmm. And um, so we're working assiduously to get information through the HIV community, through providers and others 
to say, you know, here's what may be going on. And I think most importantly to what you could do about it, because the people I've talked to who have long COVID and HIV see a real gap between what's available for HIV and what's available for complex chronic conditions. And it's devastating to them that they survived with HIV and now can't get help with this. And so I think getting information out about pacing, about potential um, safer physical therapy strategies like concussion treatment for people who are having neurological symptoms um, to be able to distinguish between um, PEM and POTS so because PEM post-exertion malaise cannot be helped and could be worsened through exercise, POTS could potentially, which is um, uh, postural orthostatic intolerance syndrome. Um, tachycardia. Can, tachycardia syndrome, right? <laughs> can be um, carefully for some people assisted through very careful rehab that can help people be more able to experience being in an upright position. So those are the kinds of basics that if we were to do like sort of the ACT UP Philadelphia standard of care today for long COVID, what's there that could be accessible to people that's not about hundreds of dollars a month of supplements and other things. Okay, do you have any uh, ideas you'd like to uh, express regarding strategies for uh, greater involvement of people of color in uh, ME groups. And in fact, I think that question can extend to long COVID groups as well. Yeah, I, I think, I mean, I'm saying this from my experience as a white person um, who's worked in alliance uh, with many black and brown leaders in the HIV movement for a long time. Um, so I have much both humility and um, uh, take very seriously uh, the over whiteness of underdiagnosed conditions. Um, I think that some things is to already start where people are rather than making them come to you. So going to um, institutions and organizations that are run by and for um, black and brown people, uh, people of color um, to with information and resources to not give them more to do but to offer um, as a resource if, if people are experiencing some challenges with the most common symptoms of what we're experiencing here. Um, also understanding that for people who may be in communities with higher prevalence of other conditions and medical complexities, that this may not sort of float to the top of people's list even if they find out about it, right? So what can be done to do uh, peer leadership and um, to fund, uh, like we're, we're hoping to fund through our fellowships for black, brown, indigenous leaders with HIV and complex chronic conditions to be able to, to say what will work for them and in their communities. Um, I think the main thing is as, as hard as it is, we have to raise funds for this work and we have to fund and give money to black and brown people who are doing this work to continue to expand their work period, rather than expecting uh, groups that may be reliant on volunteerism from resourced people to think that we'll have some breakthrough in doing stuff sort of for other people. That's not a thing. Okay, so we have one more question and then we'll end it. Uh, what can you say about uh, housing for, you know, ME patients, long COVID patients, chronically ill patients, et cetera, so that people can live in their communities? What is there that the government might be able to do along these lines? And uh, are organizations like working with, uh, you know, advocacy groups such as AARP, for example, on these issues? Yeah, that's such a great, uh, I would love to work with others to talk more about what we can do about that. I mean, in, uh, and part of, part of the, um, the mix of what allows people to stay in their homes is also about home care because people who have housing lose their housing if they can't have home care. And so um, I'm part of, been part of the, um, the uh, New York Caring Majority campaign that's been fighting to raise um, uh, the minimum wage for home care workers uh, in New York where there's mm -hmm. a drastic shortage of, of home care workers. So I think we need a, like a sort of a comprehensive solution for different kinds of housing so people have options. Um, I think that'd be a tremendously important fight. And I think it would interest a lot of people in becoming involved because it's such primary importance. Um, the mix in HIV, as far as, you know, often in any community where you ask people with HIV what their priorities are, usually the top four 
or so are housing, different housing issues, right? Like housing is a tremendous need across all societies. So I think um, having a mix of um, fighting for local, state and federal funds, and that it has to be done through meaningful involvement of people saying what kinds of housing and housing supports they need. Also providing opportunities for along the way for people to be able to um, uh, combine their resources, to be able to go into housing together, to support each other as chronically ill and disabled people, um, to be able to scale that up. I know as a corollary, though this wouldn't work for everybody, there's a great project in Memphis, um, Tennessee, that I can't tell you the name of the person who's running it because of long COVID, I don't remember names anymore, even more than before, but um, she's wonderful, who's a trans black woman who's uh, creating ho tiny houses for trans women. So these tiny houses you know, can go up a, a, a piece of land where you can put eight, 10, 12 tiny houses so people are, are, can provide for each other's safety when there's so much violence directed against trans women of color and be able to have their own home um, that's subsidized and that can be built quickly and cheaply. And that's a nice little place that you can settle in. And that's the key to them being able to like, you know, get the rest of, of, of your life to be in a more stable place if it hasn't been previously. What is the equivalent for people who are chronically ill? Is it co-housing? You know, is it being able to have intergenerational housing that's supported? Um, space for people to stay over and help? Of course, fully accessible living spaces. You know, um, coming together to demand resources to um, get that kind of housing would be great. I know it's a huge need. I'm not answering or providing anyone housing by saying that, but I think it would cut across again a lot. I, what I would want too, again, is to look at how do you do that with health equity? How do who gets to come into the housing? Do you have to have an ME diagnosis, or is it that we is this is across complex chronic conditions where people have certain symptoms or need a certain level of care? right? Because we know that people are so marginalized from diagnosis. I'd like to thank JD for a really outstanding presentation. And I'd like to thank everybody for attending. Uh, you can get a copy of the recording or information on the recording and a copy of the slides when they're available at usawg.wordpress.com. Uh, we'll be sending out an, an email to everybody to uh, let you know when these are available. And I hope you all have a nice rest of the week. Thank you.